special guest is Irish-born art director, Fiona Hayes. We can start by what inspired you to become um, an art director? It sounds really glamorous, but I'm sure there are so many elements that go into it that people absolutely don't realize. Well, it, being an art director or becoming an art director is not really something that you can um, plan in a way because it's not like just, it, it, it's a bit like deciding to be um, an award, an Oscar winning actor or something, for example, you, you can decide to be an actor, you can study your craft, you can work very hard and you can be lucky and, and become an Oscar winner. Being an art director um, is, is not a clear path. So for me, it was, uh, I studied, uh, I went to art college in Ireland where I'm from and I studied design, graphic design and history of art and design. And, um, and I actually wanted to be an illustrator when I started off, but then I realized that illustration was not a not an easy way to make a living certainly in those days so um, I moved to London and I started working as a freelance designer and I worked my way up and that's basically how you become an art director it's it's more of a, an honorific title than anything else it doesn't really mean that you know you, you spent five years studying to be an art director you study design or you study whatever else it is and a lot of the time it's also something that um, you know depends on your seniority um, in, in an organization and whatever. Same with creative director. Those titles are more descriptive than something you can kind of decide that you're going to, to be when you grow up. At what point did you start to work for Condé Nast? Because you've been with them for a long time and you have quite a very, very exciting career working with them and initiating so many projects. Well, I uh, started um, with Condé Nast in uh, let's see in 1998 actually so yes it was a long time ago and i haven't been with them continuously ever since i've had jobs with them jobs with bbc jobs with hearst jobs with various places that are not magazine publishers um but actually the way it started with Condé Nast was quite funny because i was living in london and i was the art director of cosmopolitan magazine and i had um been the art director of Russian Cosmopolitan, which is another story. Um, but I'd lived in Moscow for a short while doing that job. And I come back to London and I really wanted to live in New York and work in New York. And um, I went to New York uh, for a holiday and just sent a few messages to people, including the then editorial director at Condé Nast in New York saying, um, could I show you my portfolio? And he said, yeah, sure. Come show me the portfolio. So I did, and he was going through it, and he said, what are, you, what are you interested in? And I said, well, I really love a job in New York, like Mademoiselle or Glamour or GQ or something like that. And he said, oh, I see you've been in Russia. And I said, yes, but I'm looking for a job in New York. And he said, you know, we're launching Vogue in Russia. And I said, yes, but I'm kind of looking for a job in New York. And, uh, and so we chatted, and that was it. And I went back to my hotel room and called home here in London, and my, my husband said, uh, you had a, a message to call somebody called Jonathan Newhouse in Condé Nast. And that was how I got my first job in Condé Nast. They sent me to Russia. <laughs> <laughs> they sent me to Russia to launch Vogue. Um, and uh, so I was there for nearly two years, a year and a half, flying back and forth to London. Um, well, I had an apartment in Moscow. Um, I had staff in Moscow. I, I was speaking Russian to everybody in Moscow. Um, and I was living there, coming back once a month to see my husband, or he was coming over to see me. And then after about six months of, no, about a year and a half of that, I did another six months going back and forth more frequently as we were launching more magazines. So we launched uh, the Forerunners of Architectural Digest in Russia, of GQ in Russia. Um, and uh, and yeah, and so that's how I got to my start in Condé Nast. Attempting to get to New York, I ended up in Moscow. I, I think it sounds so brilliant and um, <laughs> funny in a great way that you wanted to live in New York. You ended up in Moscow inevitably, as one does in the cosmopolitan world of fashion. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's a little similar in the art business, but not, yeah. not quite, nothing like that. Um, yeah. So that's very, so you do speak Russian though. I, well, I, I do in theory speak Russian, 
But the thing is, so I, my first time in Russia was actually um, 1995 when I was the art director of Russian Cosmopolitan. That was just for um, for a short time because I had been art director of a British women's fashion magazine called Company. And I'd been there for about a year and a half. And the, the, the Russian Cosmo job came up um, and I got that job and studied Russian. The, 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 studied Russian, spent a very intense few months there, but then my boss there moved back to London to take over British Cosmo. So that was the the way that next move happened. Um, but when I was there first, the first thing I did was teach myself the alphabet. Because if you can read the alphabet, you can read the street signs. And that's the most important thing you need. And then when you're working in, say, fashion magazines, you really don't need to have a fast command of a language. I've, everyone in the office, not everyone in the office was speaking English. Everyone in the office wanted to speak English. But um, between, you know, they, they, they practiced their English on me. I practiced my Russian on them. So that was the first time. Then I, I went back and I did Russian lessons in, uh, when we were launching Vogue. And then, but then I moved to Germany for a couple of years to work for German Condé Nast. So I forgot all my Russian because I was studying Germany, German. And then I moved to came back and then I moved to Russia again in um, 2010 to do Russian Vogue again. And so I forgot all my German um, and the Russian sort of came back. And then I came back to London and moved to Paris. So I was speaking French on and off for six years. And after that had finished, that was another Condé Nast job. And after that, um, ironically, I got another job in Russia. <laughs> so at this point, I wouldn't say I speak any language. I speak a mishmash of meaningless words, really. <laughs> you you try to um, to speak a bit of this and a bit of that. And because for the last uh, six years that I was with Condé Nast, I was working internationally. So I we were working with teams in, um, in Portugal, in uh, Brazil, in um, Poland, Czech Republic, Hong Kong, Greece. So, you know, you, you kind of, Everyone spoke a bit of absolutely everything, and it just the, the, the you can't keep things particularly straight in your head. But it's more interesting and creative, I suppose, in a way to yeah. have a little bit of everything. A project that really stands out in terms of memory of working on it, be it the process or the end result that you think that always that's like your case study that you teach your students about. Um, there are probably a few of them that have different things, but obviously the the most um, dramatic probably was launching Vogue in Russia because it's a Vogue and it was a very big deal. So we launched Vogue in Russia in uh, 1998 and it was the first big launch that Condé Nast had done since I believe this since the 70s. I think that the previous, the last Vogue they'd launched before that was was uh, Vogue Germany in I think 1979. Um, so nothing had very much happened uh, for, for nearly 20 years. So, so when they decided to launch Vogue in Russia, which they did because um, the Berlin Wall had fallen, uh, Russia was opening up to um, to doing business with the West. People had a huge appetite for um, Western fashion, obviously, for Western culture, movies, music, everything. And also they were now open to, um, to, to doing business and it was becoming more economically viable to do business. So um, where you have this, this, uh, this uh, growing audience, you always have advertisers coming in and advertisers really wanted to put their their wares in front of the, the new Russians. And so that was the justification for launching Vogue. Um, however, we, uh, <laughs> we, we we picked a time, there the, the, was a real gold rush, but, but, but it was a very unstable gold rush. And um, Yeltsin was in charge at the time. And, um, and, and basically he, his government was, had been very dramatic and we were due to launch Russian Vogue in September 2018. So in April, I think it was 2018, um, I moved over to Moscow to set up a team, uh, get an apartment, set up the office, all that kind of stuff, hire people. 
Um, and the in, in I think in August that year, um, when we had actually finished the launch issue, it was at the printers and things started to suddenly go horribly wrong in that um, the government defaulted on its sovereign debt and the banks closed and uh, people couldn't get at their money. Um, there were protests in the streets. Um, the, the ruble was just, just plummeted in value and suddenly it looked like all this sort of like fantastic, uh, exciting, rich future for Russia had just vanished completely. Um, and it was it was felt obviously that this was not a very auspicious time to launch a, a you know the the world's fashion bible but we had to go ahead with the launch anyway um but we had to cut back there was no big party there was no big launch special event or anything like that it was very very much downplayed um but the whole experience of that was just incredible in so many ways because um because it was Vogue, everyone was very excited about it, especially, be, you know, before 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 the, the ruble collapsed. Um, and uh, we had Mario Testino fly over to Moscow to shoot the launch cover with Kate Moss and Amber Valletta. Um, we had uh, a, a photographer called Perry Ogden come over to shoot a very new, unknown young model called Giselle Bunchen, who um, sadly we didn't actually put on the cover. I, I thought of, I did try covers with her at the time, but everyone's like, well, who is she? So we didn't have Giselle. We had a very, very beautiful photograph, photo shoot with her inside the magazine. Um, but uh, but even even at that stage, a lot of things were, were going, were, were very dramatic. Like uh, the day before Mario was supposed to arrive in Moscow, um, the street outside the office building collapsed. And I remember walking into the office to work that morning and the police had blocked off all the road and saying, what's going on? And they said, there's a giant hole in the road. No one can get in there. I said, but, but, but our offices are there and not only our offices, but all the clothes for the shoot for the cover story were also in the office. Um, anyway, the, and, and we were, we had to sort of like locate very fast to a hotel and pretend to um, to Mario's team and to Kate's team and everything that this was just, you know, we were doing this because it was more fun doing it in the hotel rather than that the building was collapsing. Um, and it, it was full of fun things like that. It was a very memorable launch. And, it, and, and the great thing is that Russian Vogue actually did go from strength to strength. And as I say, I went back 10 years later uh, with a new editor who was an old friend and and did it again and that was really fun too the most i think that the most uh the most adventurous folks are actually on the whole are the younger ones i mean ukraine poland um czech republic um uh and uh, and portugal. portugal yeah portugal's amazing they really are amazing what they do is so they're always pushing the boundaries they have a very very creative very small very creative team the pandemic, obviously, uh, the the for 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 fashion magazines in particular, they really depend on um, on on connection, and they have traditionally connect, uh, depended on international travel. Um, even if you're not shooting a fashion story on location, um, very very often you would be flying a model or flying a photographer or flying a creative team to a studio in a different part of the world. So obviously, that's the first thing that went, and that's. In the end, that's not a bad thing. That's an important thing. Um, funnily enough, in in uh, January, yes, in January last year, Vogue Italia had already done um, an issue, which was called the No Photo Shoot issue. And what they their their whole idea was to produce an, an entire issue that didn't involve flying anyone anywhere to highlight the amount of waste and um, environmental damage and financial. Uh, damage that, that that big fashion productions um, cause, which in some ways is a little bit, you know, a lot of f fashion photographers felt, well, hang on a minute, that's really biting the hand that feeds you. You wouldn't be here were it not for the fabulous fashion productions that we're doing all over the world. However, leaving that aside, um, the the fact that people were basically confined to their own four walls is, has been the, the single biggest thing. Um, but what has ended up happening is it's really fueled a lot of creativity. So um, 
there has been definitely a rise in illustration. There has been um, a, a rise in, in uh, using more local photographers rather than, than, than getting big names to, to go around the world doing things. And that's a good thing anyway. Um, models taking pictures of themselves. That's been a, a, a trend in the last year. And it's been very impressive to see how many models actually are very good at this. And I, I guess the thing is, if you spend 10 years being photographed by the world's best photographers, you're going to pick up a trick or two. But it really has been nice. Um, and for instance, uh, going back to uh, Vogue Czech Republic, Vogue Czech Slovakia, uh, one of their covers last year was photographed by um, by Guinevere Van Sinas. She did a self-portrait series. And it's, it, it's just really beautiful. It's incredibly sophisticated and original. Um, and this year in, in March, Vogue Italia again had a, a model. Uh, they had Freya, Be Freya Behar Eriksson doing a, a shoot with herself. So, so it's kind of meant that people have had to improvise and the improvisation has turned out to be pretty impressive, I would say. Um, yeah, so basically the, the dance, dance ballet particularly is obviously huge in Russia. It's a very, very big part of their heritage. The Bolshoi Ballet, ballet uh, the, the Kirov, which is now the Marinsky in, in, in Leningrad and St. Petersburg, um, they have you know, just been, been, been part of Russia's heritage since forever. So back in 2012, um, uh, Russian Vogue was doing tremendously well, so well that they wanted actually to produce more content, printed content. And um, they came up with the idea of doing what they call a 13th issue, which is basically a special issue, which would be done once a year. And um, the first one that we did was Dance in Vogue. So I worked with um, the Condé Nast archivist here in London to, uh, to do, he did the main research and I worked with him on that. And I did the design and art direction and so on. And we basically used it to, to trace the history of, um, of, of fashion photography and dance photography that had appeared in Vogue. And it was, it was very beautiful. It's very exciting thing to do. Um, so, you know, we started with a, a hoist in the US in the 1920s um, and going up uh, in the 30s and then coming right up and uh, to, to Patrick de Marchelier photographing in, uh, you know, in the early 2000s with, um, with Russian uh, prima ballerinas. We had uh, the, the great picture by um, Annie Leibovitz of Rudolf Nureyev. Um, it was uh, pictures by Arthur Elgort of uh, little baby ballerina de, ballerinas in ballet school. And dance is something that's really inspired an awful lot of fashion photographers, simply because of you know, the, the, the shape of dancers' bodies and the shapes that dance makes. And um, it, it's been a big source of inspiration uh, through through the years. And I guess it, it continues. So that was that was how the Dance in Vogue issue came about. You had mentioned one of the first colored uh, covers for Vogue was of outdoor, was it swimming, I think? When you look back at American Vogue, particularly, it's fascinating how uh, how sport has has influenced the, 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 the fashion photography that's appeared in that magazine. And so I was thinking about the the first um, color cover of a, of a fashion mag color, first color photograph cover of a Vogue was I think in 1942 and it was um, shot by uh, Edward Steichen and it's a picture of a model wearing a swimsuit and holding a, a beach ball and it's quite fascinating that that was what they chose rather than a model in a ball gown or a model you know, wearing one of the new season's fashions or anything like that. It's actually a sports image. And then as time goes on, as the years go on, that um, that tradition continued through, uh, particularly in American Vogue. You're asking about what was uh, you know, some of the challenges of the pandemic for, for designers and art directors and so on. Um, and for me, I was actually incredibly lucky because I had been working uh, on various projects, but my main project um, 
from 2019 to 2020 was going back and forth to Russia um, every two weeks and running a team of 17 designers in Moscow and St. Petersburg, but in the, in the luxury retail sector. And um, when that obviously when when March happened and when the, the pandemic um, hit, that was all over because I couldn't travel at all. However, luckily for me, um, I'd just been asked if I wanted to or direct a book and the book was called the fashion yearbook and it was to be a book of photography um, covering uh, advertising um, editorial and covers in the fashion world throughout uh, 2020 and so I the editor is Julia Zirpel Julia is an old friend of mine we worked together in in Condé Nast Germany and um, Picture editor Katja Sonnevend, who's also German, and we have a contributing editor, April von Stauffenberg, who's American, despite her name. And um, and it's published by a company called Colway, but it's actually in English. And it was um, amazing because we looked, we just spent the year looking at what everyone else was trying to do to cope with, with the pandemic. And we looked at something like 1,200 stories which is an incredible number to just imagine all those were being published. People were doing that much work, um, 1200 stories. And we also had an international jury and every three months the jury would be shown about 200 stories, uh, uh, that they had to go through. Um, and, uh, and, and so we, we edited it down from that. So it, it covers, um, great covers, great advertising campaigns and great editorial. And it's been a fantastic record, I think, of, of this extraordinary year. Um, th the things that kind of stood out included, obviously, Black Lives Matter. I mean, this is actually something that was reflected in fashion magazines and on covers. Um, things like uh, the Amazon um, and, and climate change, the Amazon rainforest deforestation. Uh, climate change that has actually been reflected in fashion magazines in the last year. Um, women's rights have been very strongly reflected in, in fashion magazines in the last year. And so all of this is in our fashion yearbook. It's been um, quite incredible actually looking at it and, and, and being involved in that project. I'm tutoring actually at three different places at the moment. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm lecturing. I've always enjoyed lecturing. Um, and I, but I've never done it for, for long periods of time. I'm, I'm usually sort of doing a one-off lecture here and there. And um, uh, I, I was asked uh, at the middle of last year by a friend who runs photography courses. So he, he used to have me as his visiting lecturer at um, the University of Gloucester in Cheltenham. And uh, I would go there once a year and talk to his photography students he in the last year has become head of the photography BA course at Oxford's, Oxford Brooks University. So I am now running in a, a, a module there, uh, associate lecturer in, um, in professional practice. So it's not about photography, it's about being a, a professional in the photographic world, how you build relationships, how you um, build your network, how you how you act as a photographer in the professional world. So I'm doing that at the moment. Um, I'm also teaching something different at the Condé Nast College of Fashion and Design. They have an MA course in creative direction. Um, despite what I said at the beginning that you cannot actually say, I'm going to be an art director. Nowadays, a lot of people want to be art directors or creative directors. Um, and so the course is really to teach you the kind of skills that, that, the, that, that the role involves. So I am currently teaching um, a, a project there, um, which goes on up until June, about um, fashion exhibitions. And there's a lot of digital involved in that, which is very exciting. And the other thing is I do an annual lecture at Leeds University on um, digital, no, legacy media in a digital world. And so I did that in March and next week uh, the, the, the students are doing their presentations on it and everything. So um, teaching about photography, teaching about um, design and teaching about legacy media and digital. So it's, it's a nice kind of like mix of things to be doing.
So for people who don't have the ability for configuration of reasons to take your courses mm -hmm. and to apply to become full-time students, what is the one advice that you would give uh, photographers, be it new to mid-range, mid-career photographers who do want to become uh, work for fashion magazines or become art directors or um what is the one advice well i would say that the advice that i have always given is have your own projects um because there's no point hanging around waiting for people to to give you work because that is just not how life works really um you should uh, always be doing your own things whether I've, i've always said to students you know have a blog have a make a make a zine um do uh, do some kind of project that keeps you in contact that keeps you um, doing things that keeps you um, networking and that keeps you showing things to people as well um, and one of the big project going back to the pandemic problems uh, one thing that students have obviously had a big problem with is getting work experience work placements because that's just not happening at the moment and um, my students at Oxford for example part of their course originally was to get work placements, work experience. And um, they, you know, offices aren't open. So what do you do? So what you do, um, in my suggestion, is you, um, you, you, you talk to people, you say, so if you're a young photographer and you want to develop um, as a documentary photographer, for example, I say, right, get in touch with other people who are in your area, who are experienced, reach out to them, introduce yourself, say, can I have a call? Can I have a chat? Could I ask you about how you work? Because in real life, before all of this, it would have been great to actually go along on a shoot, to go and sit in an office, watching how people work, learning that way, but you can't do that. So um, reaching out and having conversations with people, I think is the most important thing at the moment. And that's what I'm telling all, the, all my students everywhere at the moment. Um, at some point we will be back to face to face, but you can still have a really, really important, worthwhile and, um, and, and, and growth promoting relationship simply by having a, a conversation with someone, show them your work, ask them about their work, ask them for advice, um, build your community that way. So that's what I would suggest. But your original question, Homer, about, uh, what would i suggest when i was um i have been very lucky in that i have pretty much always had work i have not necessarily always had full-time jobs but i've always had interesting work and i keep moving making sure that i take up new projects but when i um i was when i came back from russia the first the second time in 2000 um i would went to work at the bbc as a creative director of a, a new women's launch. It was called Eve magazine. And um, it, uh, it, it, was, it was really fun. It was a really cool magazine. Um, we have very different kinds of approach to stories. I, I worked with a completely different kind of photographer that I, I really wanted to do, that was great. But when I'd been there for a couple of years, um new editor was came in and of course new editor's first thing was to get rid of every all the all the old people starting with you know me i was number two on the masthead so i was number one out of the door which was completely fine because they they paid me off but and they said you're on gardening leave you have to do take no other work for three months or something and after three months i did have another job i went to house and garden so it was fab but in those three months i thought well what do i want to do with my time and what do i want to have on my cv and I thought, well, I want to start a magazine. So I did. <laughs> so I started an independent photography magazine, which is called Day Four. And I produced the first issue with a lot of pictures that I'd taken myself and pictures that some friends had taken. And um, it was really nice. And it got a really, really nice response. And the best response was when I showed it to photographers, they said, this is great. I'd love to be in something like this. And so I kept it up, even though I had after that, when I had full time jobs, I kept it going. I kept it going for 10 years. I only actually produced one issue a year, but each issue had about 20 photographers in it. So they were quite big. 
and it was called day four. And the reason for that was because um, I had this idea that if you, in an ideal world, we would work for a living three days a week. And on the fourth day, we wouldn't work for money. We would work for love. So day four is the work you do for love. And then, of course, you get a three-day weekend, which we all need anyway. Um, and and so for me, day four was such an impressive, such a such an important part of my life for ten years. I had exhibitions every year. I made so many contacts, and it was just a little something that I thought, right, I need to fill my time here for a few weeks until I can start a full time job. So this is why I always say, start your own project, whatever it's going to be. Start your own project. Keep busy. Do something. Have something to show for your time. Thank you so much for watching. We hope you consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and to follow Nisha and Nisha TV and your preferred social media platform. You will find the links down below. Hope to see you soon. Just when will I see you again? When I'm with you, I can't help but wondering. When will I see you again?